begin it now? Whom do we talk to? Anyone, everyone, everyone so served to change lives, cause lives can be changed forever. Served to change lives whenever we're working together. Talk to someone right now. Start now and why. Good afternoon, Rotarians and guests. My name is Bernie McIntosh and I'm your MC for today's meeting of Rotary Melbourne. We would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri and Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation and also pay our respects to Elders past, present and future and extend that respect to all Indigenous Australians present today. Please note that most micro microphones have been muted for the duration of the presentation accolades, comments and questions can be posted via the Zoom chat function throughout the presentation. Thanks today will be given by Suresh, Mark and Dan, followed by the loyal toast presented by President Reg. Please ensure your glass is charged. Suresh. Thank you, Bernie. President Reg, fellow Rotarians. A young village boy once asked a famous Indian guru, Swami Vivekananda, <clears throat> how he could achieve inner transformation. To which the sage replied as follows. If a drop of rain is caught by, <coughs> by clean hands, it is pure enough to drink. If it falls into a sewer, its value drops so much that it becomes useless even to wash your hands. If it falls on a hot surface, it will evaporate. If it falls on a lotus leaf, it shines like a pearl. And if it falls on an oyster, it becomes a pearl. The drop is the same, but its existence and value depends very much on who it associates with. That he explained is the power of association and the route to inner transformation. So let us reflect on this wisdom. In everything we think, say, or do, let us ask ourselves the question. Is it the truth? Is it fair to all concerned? Will it build good, goodwill and better friendships? And will, will it be beneficial to all concerned? For, a good, for good food, good fellowship, and the opportunity to serve, we give thanks. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Suresh and Bernie. Um, Rotarians and guests, let's make a toast to Australia and Rotary International. Australia and Rotary International. Members, visitors and guests, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to our 13th, our 13th meeting of this Rotary year and our 4,909th club meeting in our 101st year. Our guest speaker today is Gerard Mansour, a Commissioner for Senior Victorians. Gerard will be more fully introduced by our Chair of the Day, Past President Mary Barry, later in the program. Please join me uh, and, our, and our guest speaker, our Chair and all members visited, and making all our guests, our Chair and all members and visitors welcome today. And now, for the first of many, first of a number of updates to come, I'll call on District Governor-elect Amanda Went to update us on the District 9800 planning for 2022-23. Over to you, Amanda. Thank you so much, President Reg. Uh, it's such an exciting time to be a Rotarian, especially in Victoria and especially in our great club. From celebrating our centenary over the last two years where we've 
uh, where we continue to reflect on our en enviable legacy to looking to the future next Rotary year with the International Convention coming to town. Now, this club has so many stellar leaders, both past and present, all of whom would have been and would be the most outstanding governors. I was told last night at the Rotary Turak One uh, social event that the last time Rotary Melbourne had a district governor was in 1978. I wasn't born yet. <laughs> so it's been long overdue. And as it happens after 44 years, 22, 23 is the year Rotary Melbourne is again home to the district governor. And it is happening at a perfect time for our club district and region. So people keep asking me <laughs> the number one question is, is the role of governor a full-time job? Well, I don't know yet, but the role of district governor elect certainly is most weeks, but this is a reflection of all the hard work that's been put in now to ensure a rolling start on 1 July and of course, a very successful year. My, my main focus like every governor is to grow Rotary. And if I had to pick a side in one of the greatest Rotary debates of all time, are we a membership organization or a service organization? The assumption being that the answer to that question also answers where the most effort should be directed. Well, my answer is membership through service. Service as our purpose, but when membership lifts, everything else does as well, including our fundraising. Now there's so much that could be done, um, but I'm only in the seat for, for 12 months and to make the impact that I'd like to during my time in the role, um, I especially want to focus on supporting clubs in engaging younger members through hands-on volunteering opportunities like Second Bite, creating new cause-based satellite clubs and cause-focused community events to raise money and Rotary's profile. Now, crucially, these initiatives can be achieved at scale, creating a step change, which I argue Rotary everywhere desperately needs. I really loved as well hearing Chris talk about the hands-on volunteering at our meeting last week. It's 100% the way of the future. So thanks again for that update, Chris. Um, the first cab off the ranks in terms of deliverables has been an initiative called Greenhouse, a place to nurture ideas and initiatives to grow Rotary. And with Greenhouse, we've set up a dedicated website and Facebook group to support our 2022, 20, 23 club leaders. And the focus on content co coaching and collaboration has already attracted the attention of regional leaders throughout our zone. And Greenhouse has been regarded as an innovation in how we engage and support president elects. And I can assure you that there's lots more innovation waiting in the wings as well. So if you'd like to step outside the club and get involved at district in 22-23, please let me know. David Carruthers is already on the team as the district treasurer. Um, as we all know, Mary Barry is also leading the host organising uh, committee for the convention. And those key positions are really being sort of locked in between now and November. In terms of a role right now though, I am looking especially for someone with uh, events experience to join the president-elect capability team to assist with an upcoming in-person president-elect weekend being held in February. So if that's you or you know someone, um, I'd love to chat with uh, as soon as possible. Now 2022-23 is also the year when Rotary International makes history with its first female president, Jennifer Jones. Could argue again, long overdue for many reasons. And Jennifer is just absolutely amazing and is a longtime friend to many people in our club and district. And she absolutely loves the city of Melbourne. So we can't wait to welcome her and her team as part of the convention. Jennifer was recently invited to speak at the Global Citizen Live 24 hour event, which was held in cities across the world from like London, New York, Paris, Sydney, just to name a few. And for those who don't know, the Global Citizen events are so this generation's version of Live 8, which was, was, was a couple of decades ago, attracting those superstar performers. So my ears, though, really pricked up when they just a wonderful acknowledgement of the, of the work of the Rotary Melbourne members and for, I have to say, for your vision as well, being uh, obviously years ahead of the game in terms of where Rotary International is looking to focus next year. So thank you very much, President Reg, for allowing me to give a very brief update and hand back to you.
Thank you, Mandy. And as I mentioned, uh, we will be hearing quite a bit from Mandy regularly throughout this year and next, as it has been a long time since our club had a district governor and what a wonderful time during the Melbourne Rotary International Convention. Thank you all. Thank you to all members uh, that have actively supported the Smith family around the Bay silent auction this year. I now call on Jim Orchard from the Around the Bay team uh, to update us on the silent auction results that's just been concluded last night. Over to you, Jim. Thank you, President Reg. So yesterday was the conclusion of the Around the Bay silent auction. Thank you to all of those who donated prizes. Obviously, there is no auction without prizes. Thanks also to those who bid on the items. We had over 100 individual bids, so plenty of interest across all 23 items. From a fundraising perspective, we raised a total of 6,241. That's an unaudited figure, uh, which is a great result and a little more than we raised last year. So thanks again to everybody. Uh, this will be a big boost to the annual support we provide to the Smith Family's Learning for Life program, a program that has been very important over the last few COVID impacted years. From an administrative point of view, we will be notifying and invoicing winning bidders this week. There will obviously need to be some communications to organise the transfer of donated items to winning bidders, uh, which will obviously be subject to a few complexities. However, I'm sure this will all happen in a reasonably efficient way in the next week or two. Thank you all once again for your support and hopefully next year uh, around the Around the Bay event can get back to normal and we can all be out and about riding and helping riders in the event. Thank you very much. Thanks enormously, Jim. Uh, and uh, I, I now have a few notices that I'd like to share. Uh, I'll try and move the, through these fairly, fairly quickly. First of all, um, members this morning would have received a quick, a quick, an email with a quick club survey around COVID vaccinations. Thank you to those that have already responded. If you haven't, please give it your attention by the due date. Uh, I promise it will probably only take you about a minute to complete, but it will be very helpful in helping our team to forge a sensible uh, policy for the club in, as, as we open up in a few weeks time. Secondly, uh, the service to senior awards, uh, last, last minute nominations, I believe are still welcome. Um, and uh, uh, this award recognizes individuals who have provided outstanding service in, in a voluntary capacity to older members of our community. The nominations close this week. Look to your bulletin for more uh, information. The third point I wanted to highlight was the call for volunteers for, uh, to join Member Match to assist with international students with the goal of strengthening their social and community connections for the international students studying Victoria. This is really important because a lot of kids go home after as many as three or four years in Melbourne and lament that they didn't make any Australian friends. This is designed to overcome that. It's not about helping them gain employment nor, nor mentoring them in their, their chosen career. It's about helping them make community connection. Again, there is more information in the bulletin this week. Uh, a quick reminder, and you better be ready to hit, hit the send button straight after this, uh, this meeting because nominations close uh, at 2.10 today uh, for uh, uh, the president-elect nominee, president-elect position. Uh, uh, get, get your nominations to Russell Board as soon as possible. Uh, the fifth point I wanted to talk about is uh, the Rotary walk, walk With Us to End Polio. Uh, that's still work in progress. There's still that stubborn little um, uh, small number that we've got to help eliminate. If you love walking and would like to raise some funds to assist the Rotary Foundation, sign up as a walker or a donor for the Rotary Walk with us uh, to end polio. See the, 98, the District 9800 networker or go to www.rotarywalkwithus.org uh, for more information. And one final um, uh, late news overnight, uh, uh, we received the 
great news that Rotary Melbourne achieved a citation from uh, Rotary International uh, for its for the club's achievements in 2021. We've all been trying like mad to get our hands on a copy of it. Uh, unfortunately, that's uh, proving difficult, but uh, we will, should have one within a few days. We'll publish it on our website as soon as it's available, and uh, it'll be uh, uh, featured in the bulletin next week. Um, congratulations to the large number of members involved for your continuing good work. That's what it takes. And as soon as we have a copy, we'll get it to you. It's now my great pleasure to hand over today's meeting to our chair for the day, Mary Barry, uh, who will be introducing our guest speaker. Over to you, Mary. Great. Thank you very much, President Reg, and good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, Mandy, for a wonderful, inspiring uh, presentation. And we all look forward to taking up your role as DG. Um, Jared Mansour is a very dear friend of mine, and I've known him for many, many years. Some of you may have heard him speak at a previous lunch meeting, but he's a very highly respected and passionate advocate for the needs of older people. He was appointed as the first ever Victorian Commissioner for Senior Victorians in 2013. And in 2016, his role was expanded, which included acting as an ambassador for the prevention of elder abuse, which really gives older victims of family violence a voice and helps to raise community awareness about elder abuse. Jared also is an ambassador for Rotary Safe Families and he participated in our very first video and spoke about elder abuse in that video. It's now my great pleasure to hand over to Jared Mansour as our guest speaker. Thank you very much for that uh, lovely warm welcome, Mary. And it's a pleasure to be able to come back and talk with Melbourne Rotary. And I recognize a number of um, friendly faces from last time. So um, delightful to be with you. I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the, the different lands that we're on today. I'm on the lands of the Rwandjuri people and their elders past, present and emerging. Um, look, I'd like to, to um, take you through a little bit of a presentation about uh, a number of key issues related to elder abuse and ageism. Uh, this coming Friday is the International Day of Older Persons that falls on the 1st of October every year. And so this year, a, a whole consortium of organisations have come together. And for the first time in Australia, we're calling that Anti-Ageism Day. So I'd like to take you through a few um, of the key issues about elder abuse, how it links to ageism, and some of the finish with some of the practical resources that are available. Um, the reality is lots of us, uh, any of us, could come in contact with an older person who's at risk of elder abuse. And I think it's really useful for us to know where we could go and how we could reach out to provide support in the event that that happens. Uh, and of course, it could happen very close to us. The reality is these type of things can happen um, with people that are very close in our friendship circle. So hopefully I'll be able to share my screen um, and we'll be able to see the presentation. So did that work there, Mary? Hopefully, think, think. excellent, thank you. So um, one of the, the contexts, I think, when we think about elder abuse, it's really important to start with the context of rights. Uh, just like with family violence more broadly, it's really important to sit back and say, well, what are the rights of us uh, as individuals as we get older? And of course, we've got the right to be treated with respect and dignity, free from exploitation, violence and abuse. And so elder abuse is defined through the World Health Organization. And in Victoria, we've adopted that type of approach where it's acts of abuse or harm associated with relationships of trust. So it's not seeking to cover in its definition things like, say, residential aged care that are covered by its own protector and, and regulatory framework. It's people that are in the lives, actively parts of the lives of older people. Um, the most common form of abuse, the uh, abuser of older people are actually their adult children. Around about 70% of the abuse that older people will experience is from their own children. Um, behind that, of course, then we've got other forms of abuse, um, which I'll talk about in a second. So the, there are six primary types of abuse that older people tend to face. 
Some of the abuse is, of course, very similar to gender-based violence. So just like anywhere in the life course, there are um, forms of violence perpetrated by a partner against an older person. They tend to be lower proportions of reporting. And so one issue that we do know we've got to confront is encouraging more older women to come forward and report abuse within their relationships. Again, the most significant form of abuse tends to be packaged on this particular slide here. So it's very common that abuse will have a financial element. Um, an emotional and psychological element and a social element. So a very common example is an older person might have one of their adult children move back in their own home, um, ostensibly to provide care and support. And, and often, as we know, that's a, a really key ingredient of many older people to be able to be sustained in their own homes. And so most of the time that works in an exceptionally positive way, but sometimes it becomes the basis for abuse. And so the person that's living in the home takes funds or assets. It can start with very small amounts of money. You know, they might be going down to assist with the shopping and have the credit card. And it just provides an opportunity to abuse. Sometimes it's about um, making forced changes to legal documents. And we're increasingly hearing language about things like uh, inheritance abuse. The idea that um, some family members believe it's their right to take control of the assets of an older person. And of course, they seek to do that at a time when the older person still needs those, um, those income or those assets. It's often tied with demeaning behaviour, intimidation, um, and very sadly, like a lot of uh, um, crime and abuse, the perpetrator of abuse often tries to isolate an older person from their family and their loved ones and their friendship groups. And I often say that that's one of the early indicators and one of the things that often when, when somebody is concerned about an older person and they reach out to my office and um, ask for assistance and guidance about where they can go, it's often the trigger has been suddenly their friend or their mother or their grandmother um, isn't responding to them anymore and they've sort of disconnected themselves from other members of the family. And it's often one of the warning signs that there are risks of abuse happening within um, the, the life uh, of that older person. Um, other forms of abuse are um, less common, but, but equally um, you know, abhorrent and significant, physical abuse, sexual abuse and neglect. And of course, the physical one is um, a very significant one too, because a very minor push or a shove to an older person that may say have a walker frame could be enormously damaging to them in their well-being. So whilst um, these um, three areas occur less, they can be some of the most significant and tragic forms of abuse that an older person will experience. And so with that sort of background, I thought it'd be useful to talk about and share with you some of our more recent learnings over the last few years of trying to get a better understanding of what are the drivers of abuse that older people um, experience? Why is it that you know, a, an adult child would feel that they've got a right to somehow take assets or constrain the quality of life to an older person? And we've learned a lot from the work that's happened um, in terms of understanding family violence and gender-based violence. And ageism certainly has a role to play, that our community can take a stereotypical approach to older people, that, oh, you're old and frail, therefore you're, you're past your use by date. And so if you think of some of the language that we've got in our society about how we refer to older people, how we feel as an individual, very interestingly, one of the challenges of ageism is that we can internalise ageism ourselves. And I'll talk with you and share with you in a few minutes uh, some of the findings from my report that I published at the end of last year. But one of the real challenges that we've got is often older people themselves demean their own contribution. Uh, and so this internalisation of abuse, oh, if the society sees me, sees older people as less valuable, oh, therefore I must be less valuable as well. And I think uh, organisations like Rotary and the leadership that you provide is such a critical part of this. And, you know, I know when you look at many of the Rotary groups, there are lots of, of older people who are enormously significant contributors 
if you look in so many local community organisations and you look at their boards or committees, you'll often find that it's older people that are key parts of making organisations being able to operate by being on their boards and their committees. They're such a significant part of our volunteering movement. You know, the, the single largest cohort of people who are volunteers are, of course, older people. And so you've got this really um, challenging issue in our society where we've got this often stereotypical approach to older people and the perception of them having less value and less to contribute. And that's often represented in a structural way. And I'll, I'll share some of that with you uh, now. And so I had a chance last year to, um, to do a report on ageing well. And so as part of my role of, as commissioner, my responsibility is to pick emerging issues. And I see this as a really important one. One of the great positive things happening to so many of us, um, albeit uh, despite the challenges of COVID that we're in at the moment, is that our current generation is living longer than previous generations. But it's not just a longevity age issue. People have a much better understanding of health and activity, the importance of staying active, the importance of you know, doing puzzles to keep our minds active. And so people have a greater opportunity to age well than they have in previous generations. But of course, that confronts a whole lot of things around socioeconomic disadvantage. It's not an even spread of what's happening in the quality of life of older people. And so part of the purpose of my report was to identify from an older person's perspective, how do they see the key attributes of ageing well? And I'll finish with a reference for those of you that might like to, to have a look at my report in a bit more detail. And today I'm just going to touch on a couple of those from the perspective of ageism and elder abuse and, and how older people see those issues. Not surprisingly... Um, as we age, having a meaning and purpose in our life is just so central to our well-being. And in so many ways, it is tied to the very purpose of organisations like Rotary, that people still have a chance to connect, contribute and, and to be valued. Um, so this is a really important part of life. For many of us, as we age, we just sort of find new things to inspire and motivate us. But I learned from the stories that people came to my consultation sessions, not everybody has that pathway. For some people moving, for example, from a paid employment role to a, to a more of a retirement really jars their sense of meaning and purpose. Sometimes it's changing roles within a family. I can remember a story of an, of an older male who shared with me the really challenge that they had to their journey of, of aging was when their role in the family changed. And he said to me, like, I was always the go-to person and now my children tell me what to do. And so he hadn't rediscovered for him what was going to give him meaning and purpose in life. And this, of course, is central because I mentioned the issue of isolation and loneliness uh, earlier as, a, as an indicator of, of elder abuse occurring. But it's also a risk factor. The more people are isolated from life and from connections and social groups, the more they are at risk of from abuse uh, and experiences with their in their own family network. Uh, another challenge that exists for all of us is the sense of diversity. Uh, what occurs in, in communities can vary significantly depending on, say, cultural attributes and cultural expectations. When I was doing um, part of the research for my report, I travelled down to Gippsland. And I can remember in the group, I, I met with a, a group of uh, Greek community that's located down in that area. And they shared with me that, you know, often in their community, there was an expectation, for example, that the adult, the oldest adult child would automatically be the person who'd be their power of attorney. And often they wouldn't want that person, but there was this real cultural expectation that that was a role that they had to come to. And so part of the conversation with me was, do we have to do that? Are there other things that we could do? So sometimes whilst we've got the richness of cultural attributes, sometimes older people themselves can perceive that as a barrier um, to them receiving the sort of quality of life that they want. A really central part of, of getting older is the importance and the value that people attach to giving and receiving respect. And so from an older person's perspective, when they shared their, their view about what does it mean to age well, it was very much a two-sided coin that they wanted to have respect and be given respect, but they also knew that they had to do that and pass that on to other generations as well. And there was a real sense that they didn't want to just be treated like an older person, that life age doesn't define who they are. 
and they didn't want to be pigeonholed and put in a box. For example, uh, because I'm older, therefore I'm suddenly going to have less capacity to innovate or to use technology. And so there's a real sense of just because we're old, we want to, don't want to be defined in a negative way as people that have less to contribute to our society. And they could actually articulate very clear to me about not being subject to ageism, to stigmatisation. Often they use different language. Um, you know, the language around ageism is not a word that older people use, but they were very able, able to give me very clear examples of structurally how um, in society they had less opportunity at, at many points of the journey from their perspective. Very interestingly, and when I asked them to tell me what were the challenges of getting older, one of the most common words they used was the word of invisibility and word invisibility, that they felt that as they got older, the community just didn't perceive them in the same way as they did at other points of their life and their life journey. And so I think a really important connection about how we address elder abuse is actually by increasing the value and the respect and the acknowledgement of what older people themselves contribute to our society in so many different ways. And that's the addressing ageism challenge. It's about looking at a whole range of different ways. And often it's through intergenerational experiences. And now, again, with organizations like Rotary covering a whole lot of enormous age groups, that's a really important and a positive way and a positive um, enabler of building greater respect across all the generations. One of the really important protective factors for, for all of us as we get old from any form of abuse, but particularly elder abuse, is staying connected with friends, family and society more broadly. And this is a really important attribute and a central one to well-being. Obviously, for many older people as they get older, um, their community often changes around them. If we think of the place where we live, Often our community itself is going through change. We have people moving in and out of the community. Um, and for people that are fortunate to live long enough, they often find that their family network and their friendship network changes. Some people may themselves move to different parts of the community. Um, adult children or grandchildren may move to different geographic areas. And so we can't assume that everybody actually has good, strong friendships and relationships. From work that I've done elsewhere in, in my role as commissioner, I know that at least 10% of people aged over 60 experience chronic isolation and loneliness. And so that's different to the feeling of lots of us have an experience of, of loneliness or isolation at some point of our life. But this is 10% of people that have an enormously significant detrimental experience of um, isolation and loneliness. And it is a significant risk factor for people in terms of abuse. And so retaining connections, um, having outreach to friends, not, left it, not letting people that are an important part of our life drift away from us, um, a friendly phone call just to check how people are going. There are a lot of the messages that I would give directly if I was talking to groups of older people. I would encourage older people themselves positively to stay connected with their own family members, but I would really encourage them to stay connected with people in their lives. And all of us know that there are people that drift away from our friendships and our relationships. And so, again, just as ageism um, and addressing positive attributes and positive images of the role of older people um, is a really important part of prevention from an individual level remaining connected to friends and family and society is a really central part of, of all of our well-being. Um, so in terms of, um, you know, a congratulations to, to Mary and others who I know played a really significant role in the Rotary Safe Families program. I was so delighted, I tell you, that to have a, a reach out to me as a commissioner to say that when you were doing that work, you wanted to look at the stories and the narratives of elder abuse. And for me, you know, I was delighted to play a very small role in, in the promotional material. And so it's something I very actively promote in my work. I've promoted on my social media and other places. So I wanted to congratulate you all which for what I think is a really important program to remember. And often, often our minds go when we think of abuse to the tragic stories we see in the media and, and those things need to continue to dominate government action. But there's also a whole lot of abuse against older people that is less visible. And so I was delighted to see that, you know, Rotary took the initiative, making sure that the, the, the differences and the subtle differences of elder abuse were presented in the work that you did there. And so my sincere congratulations to you. Um, so what are the things that I focus on and, and how do I work? Um, part of it is around empowering older people to act themselves. 
a really important part of the message is that um, older people, just because we get older, we doesn't, don't lose that sense of agency of, of our lives. And so that they can act to speak to someone they trust. To, often they'll reach out to a health professional or to a friend and say, look, things aren't right. Sometimes older people find abuse by their own family members to be enormously challenging and confronting because they'll often own that as a sense of their own failure as a parent. And so, you know, um, often it takes um, years for an older person to, to be willing to talk out uh, against abuse. And of course, if anyone is in immediate danger, I'd always encourage them to, to ring triple zero and act on it. Uh, there's a couple of uh, really valuable and important resource guides that I think are useful for us all to know about. Um, I mentioned earlier that often an older person will disclose the abuse to someone who's close to them. Uh, and they'll often, um, the person who raises a concern about abuse will often be a concerned person in their life somewhere who, who sees this sense of isolation or disconnection. And so the Council of the Aging developed um, Seniors Rights Victoria, this really useful resource booklet that can be sent out that can be found on their website um, that gives really clear guidance about what are the things and the pathways that are available to provide support to older people. One of the things that I often talk about, and, and this comes up so often with older people, is making sure that in their life, they've got the right trusted people in their life. And it's often an issue that they'll raise with me more privately. Um, so if I go to a public meeting, I do a presentation about a topic like this, often they'll come up to me and they'll say, look, a few years ago, I appointed someone as my power of attorney but I think I've now picked the wrong person. Can I change that? Or they'll say, what are the powers that I can put in? And again, this publication was developed with older people and it's got a whole lot of tips and guidance and again, can be available. Um, and importantly, people can ring the Office of the Public Advocate get access to a copy of this and uh, the, the pro formas, which are free, um, but also some guidance about uh, our powers of attorney as a protective factor from individual older people. So I'll just finish there, Mary, um, and say that people that wanted to connect with me with my social uh, media, I'm you know, always welcome to do that. But there are those resources, and I'm very happy to make this presentation available so that people can um, get access to those resources if they would like to do so. And so if um, I'm able to do so, I'll stop sharing my screen, uh, but I'll work out a way how to do that. Great. Thank you very much, Ger, for that amazing overview of a very important issue. And it's great, again, that you're able to participate in our Safe Families program. Um, I might just start the ball rolling with the question for you. When you spoke about older people needing and you know, staying connected to family and friends, are there any statistics that show us that in incidents of elder abuse have increased during COVID? I know there are stats that show violence against women and family violence in general have increased, but is there anything to tell us elder abuse has increased? Uh, there's sort of two, two trends happening there, Mary. That's a really perceptive question. Interestingly and not surprisingly, the number of people who are reaching out to the specialist organisations like Seniors Rights Victoria have actually declined. Um, and uh, part of the reason and part of the fear is that the people that are living with abuse, for example, an adult child in their own home, don't have the same capacity uh, while we're all isolated in their own home to be able to reach out. So there's a real fear amongst so many organisations like Seniors Rights Victoria that it's at, at the point of coming out of the, of the periods of lockdown when their numbers go up. And that's what the data has been showing. So as we move into lockdowns, there's less reports of abuse. As we're coming out of lockdowns, there's greater an increase in, in reports and reaching out. The other thing that um, is very clear from the trend data is that the type of abuse is more significant. And again, I think it reflects the fact that the nature of elder abuse being occurred um, so often by um, people in their trusted circle, the nature of abuse that older people is, are experience are far more complex. And so the, the actual type of cases and the type of abuse has significantly increased in its um, complexity and its uh, level of concern. Okay, thank you. Now, Sandra Hills, you had a question. Would you like to ask Jared your question? 
Hi, Jared. <laughs> yes, it's me. Um, Jared, I just thought that people might be interested to hear about, people would know that the Commonwealth Government fund a lot of more formal services, but what does the state government fund in regards to reducing ageism, reducing social isolation, and obviously elder abuse? What sort of programs are they funding? Thanks very much, uh, Sandra. Great to hear your lovely voice again. Uh, like so many people, looking forward to when we can all be back in the room again and actually eyeball each other. Um, yeah, look, there's a, a couple of really important programs from a state perspective. One is that they do fund um, an organisation called Seniors Rights Victoria, and um, it's, a, it's a service provided through the Council of the Ageing. And there's a significant financial contribution that the government makes. And part of that money is to provide frontline services in terms of a support service to older people, including things like legal advice. Um, and if there are you know, service organisations like yours, Sandra, where um, staff themselves were concerned about the well-being of somebody that they were visiting in their own home, they'd also be welcome to use that helpline and reach out and seek some guidance about what support might be available. In addition to that, um, part of their role um, and part of their funding is, again, promoting the importance of anti-ageism and anti-ageism campaigns. A significant part of the work that I'm doing just at the moment is I'm chairing an a senior Victorians advisory group as a part of um, the, re the government responding to my report. The, there's a, an advisory group that's preparing a whole lot of proposals to go back to the state government and can be considered by cabinet in the next few months. And so as part of that work, not surprisingly, Sandra, the whole issue of ageism and addressing ageism and seeing the need to do more as a structured campaign is a central part of, um, of the advice that we're receiving from the group. I coincidentally just chaired the most recent meeting of that yesterday. And not surprisingly, this was one of the key topics that the, um, that the advisory group itself is going to be recommending back to state government. So that's just a, a couple of um, high level points that um, to respond to there, Sandra. Okay, thank you, Jared. We have a question from Joel Mavros. Joel, would you like to ask your question? Oh, thanks, Mary. I didn't expect that. Um, I'm just wondering how you uh, manage the cultural differences when it comes to seniors. Great question. Um, one of the challenges in a role like mine, and I noticed um, a couple of people put comments in the chat there, is making sure that um, I connect with the enormous range of diversity of older people. Um, I, I think about older people in so many different ways. We've got to think about identity. So things like, you know, their, their, their gender, their view of their own gender their identity that's connected to that, their culture, their cultural diversity, where they live geographically. All these things are enormously um, impactful of, of older people and their, and their views. And so when I do key projects um, and provide advice, I, I tend to do it in two ways. One is that I, I always get lots of opportunities and invitations to talk to groups. And so I pay a lot of attention to where I'm going and making sure that um, I'm, I'm going enough into regional areas. I'm talking to culturally specific groups, to people from different religious backgrounds, uh, people from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander descent. Uh, can, um, so I make sure that in my proactive um, response that there's a real balance. The other thing I do is that if I'm responding to quite specific issues, so um, one of my most recent significant contributions was to the Mental Health Royal Commission, I will bring together with the support of so many organisations, um, including people like Benitas and others, to get the right group and mix of people in the room to provide me quite specific advice. And that's what I did in that particular case. I wasn't confident that my general interaction with older people and its, all, its diversity was sufficiently in depth to tell me about the mental health challenges of older people. And so drawing on that, I then made my submission and I was really delighted to see that in the recommendations, there were some quite specific recommendations about the needs of older people and the differences of those needs. So that's how I tend to do it. I, I try to make sure that as far as possible, um, all my outgoing communication is as diverse as possible. If you look, for example, at the makeup of the advisory group, um, diversity was a really critical part of how that group was put together and the advice we gave the minister in, in the people that uh, the minister would invite to be part of that group. 
And then I always make sure when I'm dealing with quite specific issues like um, um, the one around mental health that I have the right people in the room to provide advice. Thank you, Jared. We now have another question from Bernie. Bernie, would you like to put your question? G'day, Jared. Bernie McIntosh. Um, th this is probably a, a, a around reverse mortgages. Um, we've seen abuse to do with reverse mortgages where children are encouraging parents to access the equity of their properties and children also discouraging the access of equity in their properties. Has there been some work done with the, to educate the major banks and financial institutions as to the finan that financial abuse of elders? Yeah, thanks, Bernie. That's, that's a really good question. And because financial abuse, as I said, if you look at just the raw data, 70% of all abuse um, has a financial element. So it's been a critical part of our work in a number of different ways. On a national level, one of the outcomes of the, the Royal Commission into the banking sector is each of the banks has been required to set in place a whole lot of initiatives around older people. And so, for example, um, tellers now have certain trigger points about who can and can't do transactions and the proactive follow-up that they'll make with older people around that. And the Commonwealth Bank itself has actually published a public guide. So, you know, there's, there's more, there's movement in the banking sector and the, the financial sector. One of the really positive things that's happened within the last year is the um, financial counselling um, uh, sector through their peak body has provided a training program for financial counsellors around elder abuse. So some of the abuse is around high levels of income. Um, others are people on very modest means that lose access to really, you know, really basic things. And so the financial counselling sector itself has become much more involved. And so if you look at the, um, the orange doors, for example, Bernie, um, in each of the orange doors that's established to date, there's now a pathway for people where there is financial abuse to get returned to the financial counsellors. So it's been a central part of... Um, of the of the referral system, um, so that's just sort of a couple of practical examples of of um, the responses to financial abuse. Um, the other is that um, through a very proactive campaigning, and I you know I talk regularly with people like Kay Patterson, our you know our federal age discrimination commissioner, about the importance of powers of attorney. Mm. It is a really important protective factor for people to have uh, you know those powers of attorney in place and the right person. And so people like Kay and myself have been working you know quite. Um, aggressively, I suppose, the word of encouraging as many older people as possible to have their own individual powers of attorney in place and have the right people there. And the final thing that I would say is that um, there's a really important resource, again, that Seniors Rights Victoria has developed. The most complex financial abuse matters that I've, I've had to deal with, uh, Bernie, that have come my way is where people have transferred an asset to an older person, or sorry, an older person has transferred an asset to one of their adult children in return for the expectation of lifelong care. And what inevitably happens is there's no document. There's a transfer of asset and it's been almost impossible to get justice for those people because they ended up in long-term Supreme Court lists and generally the money is gone and the pathways for older people are very limited. So there's now a positive resource around assets for care where there's a, a, part, um, a booklet and guidance notes on how to develop uh, actually formal documentation that protect an older person. So they're just some of the examples that are things that exist there, Bernie. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Jared. Now I've got a question from Peter Berg. Peter, over to you. Uh, sorry. Uh, hello, sorry, Jared. I have unmuted myself. I didn't realise. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Sorry, I'm having trouble there. Sorry about that. Um, thanks, Jared, for your presentation. Um, my question is, um, how do you handle a sensitive family situation when one child is abusing a parent and the parent is not welcoming of another child's intervention to correct the situation. Yeah, very sadly, Peter, I'd love, you know, I, you might be surprised to know that is just so common as part of the process that um, because the person who's the perpetrator of abuse has been very successful in isolating other family members, there's a real tension about how an older person can deal with that. 
One of the, the positive pathway things, and I know we've, we've had very good feedback where, where the adult person um, has been willing to reach out, is through referrals to organisations like Better Place and Relationships Australia. So they've, by, by moving into a model of, of family counselling, there's been some really good success in getting those issues dealt with. The earlier that occurs in the experience of abuse, not surprisingly, there's, there's more success. Once it gets really embedded, very sadly, when it gets to the, to the point that need, people need to consider um, legal pathways, um, taking out orders and restricting access, then it becomes extremely difficult because as you would fully understand, an older person is going to be very reluctant to do take that sort of thing against their own children. And so, yeah, it's looking at early intervention models where people are prepared to, say, take family counselling and family relationships pathways to interventions. And we've had some really good outcomes around agreements that have come out of those, um, but they tend to be most successful in the earlier stages of the, of the experience of abuse, Peter. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. We now have a question from Bev Brock, our president-elect. Now, Bev, you're on mute or we can't hear you. Yep. Thanks very much, Jared, for the uh, wonderful um, uh, presentation. I do a lot of public speaking to community groups, uh, view clubs, probus clubs, aged care facilities on that life is what you make it. What's concerned me since the pandemic struck is that the vast majority of those talks has ceased because the groups don't have, they're you know, older and they don't have access to technology and use Zoom. Is there any program in place that, that helps with the oldies to get used to using something like Zoom so they don't go into that sense of isolation? Living on, the, on their own through this time has been absolutely diabolical. So it, it just, you know, a program that helps them master and get to use technology uh, would be extremely valuable. Yeah, Bev, look, that uh, fantastic um, question and comment there and observations. Interestingly, um, it's probably the area where I've heard the most positive feedback. So I've had a chance wherever I can to get out and about again, sometimes between those break uh, lockdowns, but also through a whole range of connecting um, mechanisms. And there's lots of organisations, local governments, for example, neighbourhood houses, um, University of the Third Age Group, Men's Sheds. A lot of those have taken the opportunity in the last 18 months to provide training opportunities for people to connect through Zoom and other, you know, other sort of um, online platforms like that. And so I've actually heard quite positive feedback from lots of older people saying to me, oh, I didn't realise with the support that I could actually do that. And so um, that's clearly going to continue. One of the, the most significant groups outside the ages and one that I, that I shared with you from the advisory group, the whole issue of the digital divide is going to be a central part of the advice from this advisory group to the state government about the need to do more in that place. But there's also a second issue that comes up very strongly, Bev, and it's that, yes, there's going to be great capacity with training to increase more older people using technology, but there's always going to be a group of older people that can't. And so we must have um, alternate pathways through things like telephone, face-to-face -face contact, where older people aren't always pushed into a technological solution, that there are alternate pathways as well. But you're raising, I think, what is the one of the most significant issues for older people at the moment is the, the growth of that digital divide. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jared. Unfortunately, we're just about running out of time. There are another couple of questions. Um, one is just about the resources you have and one is about um, targeting schools and education. So perhaps we can send those on to you and you could answer them for us and we can um, get the replies back to the people who sent them in. So my apologies for not being able to get to them all. But thank you very much for a wonderful presentation and for especially all the questions that were coming up, obviously a topic of great interest to our members. And of course, we will be sending you a pair of our R100 socks, these limited edition, and they're a commemorative, obviously, of our centenary year. And I'm pleased to say that they're 200% Australian made in Preston by our own past president, Philip Endespace from Wilderness Wear. So thank you 
very much, Philip, for the wonderful socks. And thank you very much, Jared. And we'll get the socks to you. And I'm sure on behalf of everybody, I'd like to sincerely thank you. Could we show our appreciation for Jared and his presentation, please? Thank you, everybody. And now I'm just going to hand back to President Reg. Well, can I just add my thanks, Jared? That was a very enlightening uh, uh, presentation and I think greatly appreciated by our members. I'd like to uh, also acknowledge presence today uh, from Sandra Hills, who kindly asked a question, who's an expert in this space, as you well know, and also Peter Major, Manger, uh, a major supporter of Casper Care. Also, uh, I know not everyone here is an active supporter of the Melbourne Football Club, but I think it's, I'd just like to suggest we take a moment to think about our beloved member who passed away just less than a month ago, uh, who was a passionate Melbourne supporter for the marvellous uh, grand final that both the Doggies and the Dees delivered this year. But the extraordinary performance of David's beloved club was amazing. So uh, let's just reflect on that. Thank you also to our MC, Bernie McIntosh, for, and for today's reflection, uh, Suresh Markenden. Uh, and also, uh, Mary, thank you for your uh, skilled chairmanship and getting us to uh, uh, an on-time finish. Thanks very much. Um, thank you to all members, visitors and guests uh, for attending. A reminder that next week our guest speakers are not re renowned mental health researchers, Professor Anthony Jorn and Betty Kitchener, CEO of Australian Rotary Health, speaking on mental health first aid, a timely topic um, in this, these challenging times will be our annual hat day uh, for Australian Rotary Health, supporting mental health research. And we hope you will wear a hat for awareness and contribute when booking uh, in the voluntary donation space. Be delighted too if you could invite a guest uh, to join us for this uh, on, part, on a partner's day. Um, we hope you can be there. And now I close the meeting uh, with us with a uh, a song from a well-known elder, but perhaps an expert in ageing a little disgracefully, Keith Richards, uh, with accompanying uh, Nora Jones. Um, and I hope you enjoy. And uh, uh, in the meantime, everybody, please stay safe and spread kindness.